Okay, for part A, you're trying to find the total mechanical energy. So you take the potential, which they give you right here, 4x squared. You plug in the value that they give you of 0.5, and then you've got your kinetic potential term added together. So you get 1 half 3 times 2 squared plus 4 times the position squared, and you get a total energy of 7 joules for part A. For part B, they want you to find the position at which the object has no kinetic energy. So now that you know the total is 7, you just set the potential equal to the total which makes the kinetic equal to zero, and you solve for x, and you get the square root of seven over four, plus or minus. Part C it says find the momentum. So what you have to do here, it takes a little bit more work, you use conservation of energy again with the position that they gave you. They want you to find it at 0.6. So you basically take seven minus that potential energy that you get here, try to find the kinetic energy, um, and solve for V you get a V of about 1.93 meters per second. When you multiply that by the mass of three, you get a potent, uh, I'm sorry, a momentum of about 5.78 or 5.8 kilogram meters per second. Um, part D asks you to find the acceleration. So you have to use the uh, force potential derivative equation. Uh, you take the negative derivative of the force with respect to x, and you get negative 8x instead of 4x squared, what it originally was, plug in the value that they give you, and you get a force of negative 4.8 newtons. When you divide that by the mass of 3 kilograms, you get an answer of 1.6 meters per second squared, and that should actually be negative because it's um, slowing down at that point. Um, if you didn't notice, this is a, the force is a negative constant times x, which is the form of a spring force. So that, that's the hint right there that the graphs are going to be periodic. And so when they tell you to plot the position graph and they tell you to start at x equals 0, the x equals 0 part is telling you that it's a sine graph. So it would look something like that. Okay. When you graph the kinetic energy, um, the kinetic energy is going to be a maximum whenever the position graph hits a 0. So it's a max here, max here, max here, max here. So uh, there you have it. There's number 1. Number two was the one that I told you was very difficult. Um, part A was very difficult. And basically, um, you had to take advantage of this torque equation for part A. So torque equals moment of inertia times alpha, but it also equals R cross F. There's that vector product. Now, typically, we've had degrees of, I'm sorry, angles of 90 degrees. But here, we can't assume that the angle is always 90 because the, um, the bar is swinging back and forth and changing the angle. So gravity, which is mg, cross r, which r is just going to be x, which is the point where the force of gravity will act here at the center of mass, halfway down the bar. So it's, it's gravity times x times the sine of the angle in between them. And it's minus because it's always going to be a restoring force. Gravity is pulling it downwards, so it's, there's a negative sign there. Now that's all equal to i alpha, and all I did here was... They wanted you to find the um, differential equation, which means that you put it in derivative form. Alpha is acceleration, so it's just the second derivative of the angular position divided by, or, uh, with respect to time squared. So all you do is rearrange that, divide the i over, and there's your answer. This part is the part where I had kind of said that we had, it's not that I didn't teach you this, it's that we spent very little time on this. But if you look at the form of this equation that you just found in part one, this is an acceleration equals some constant. All of those make up a constant. Those are all constant values times the position. So it, it has the form of acceleration equals constant times position. Well, this is periodic motion. So the general form of periodic motion, x equals cosine omega t. Uh, sometimes you see it with an a in front of it for the amplitude. But the, uh, the way that this works, if you take the derivative of position, you get velocity. And because of the chain rule, you get that negative omega from inside the cosine function pulled out. If you take the second derivative, you get the acceleration. So you get a negative omega squared times cosine omega t. Well, that is the same thing as a equals negative omega squared times x again, because x, the original function, was just cosine of omega t. So now if you look up at this thing, this is a. This is the value omega squared. This whole thing equals omega squared. And this is like your x again, so it's alpha 
and theta instead of a and x, but this constant right here is represented by omega squared. So down here, if you set your negative omega squared equal to minus mgx over the moment of inertia and rearrange some things, you end up at the value of the period being 2 pi times the square root of i divided by mgx. Parts b and c are explained very well in the solution, so I'll just leave those alone. For this last one, okay, in part a, it says, drive an expression for the speed of the hanging block as a function of the distance. Um, so you can't use kinematics here. I mean, I'm sorry, you can't use Newton's law here like a normal Atwood problem because of the fact that it's a function of distance. You could use kinematics, but I just use conservation of energy. So potential equals kinetic. Um, the only thing that's a little tricky here is the potential energy is only due to this block, but the kinetic energy after it starts to move is due to both of these blocks. So this mass is the sum of those two. And when everything cancels out, you get the final velocity after it's fallen a distance d as equal to the square root of g times d. Okay, For part b, um, you've got a rope that's sliding off the edge here, and so the amount that's fallen off the edge gets heavier and heavier as the rope gets longer. So you kind of look at it like uh, dm is sort of like a little piece of the rope, and what you do is you take the entire mass divided by the entire length, times how much of it's hanging over. It's kind of like a linear density thing. So this is how much mass per unit length for the rope times however much rope is hanging off. So at any given moment, the mass of the rope that's hanging off is m divided by l times y. So to get the force, all you got to do is take m times g times y, all that divided by the length. So this m l over y just gets multiplied by g. So there's your force of gravity at any given moment. Okay, um, part C asks you to find the work, so all you got to do is take the integral form of the work equation, which is work equals f dy. So the mgl, that's a constant, that all gets pulled out, and you have the y in there times the dy. The integral of y dy is just y squared over 2, so the work done is just mgy squared over 2l. Um, as you might expect, the next question they ask you after they ask for the work is to find the velocity. And so they're driving basically at the um, work energy function. So work is equal to the change in kinetic energy, but it's the final minus zero. So it's just equal to the final kinetic energy. So 1 half mg squared equals what you just found, mgy squared over 2L. When you end up solving for V, you get gy squared over L, but you can pull the y out. So you get V equals y times the square root of g over L. At the bottom... Um, the question asks you about the speeds of the two different systems, and you might be tempted to say that the block is faster, you might be tempted to say that the rope ends up faster. The truth is, they both have the same mass, and they have the same distance fallen, and so because they have the same potential at the beginning, that means their speeds at the end, and you know their kinetic energies at the end are going to be the same. See you tomorrow.